What's happening, guys? Welcome to my review of this past week's episodes of TNA, NXT, SmackDown, Lucha Underground, and Ring of Honor. Today's Monday. Hope you guys had an epic weekend. Looking forward to tonight's episode of Monday Night Raw. Taking off from last week's explosive episode after Battleground. Hoping it's an exciting episode. Hoping to watch it tonight or tomorrow and drop my review as well. And afterwards, the next episode, of course, bringing back Audio Universe mode this week as we head to our next pay-per-view payback. So I hope you guys are looking forward to that. I've taken a week off to, you know, just to refresh and prepare for the following week. I think I'll be doing that after every pay-per-view. Just take some time off to prepare for the next uh, month of Audio Universe. So look forward to that. But in this episode, take a look at what happened this past week. Some pretty eventful stuff happened uh, in these shows, particularly Lucha Underground, NXT, SmackDown. TNA had a couple of matches worth mentioning. Uh, Ring of Honor celebrating its 200th episode. We'll touch on that. They had an amazing uh, main event. They also had some highlight matches taking uh, that have happened during these 200 episodes. Some great matches there. Loved them. Let's start off with Lucha Underground. This was the episode before Ultima Lucha, which has been split into two weeks as opposed to one. So this is a big, big event. Uh, looking at their match card, yeah, they've got a, a number of epic matches ahead. So splitting it into two weeks, I think that was a smart idea. I'm just wondering how long uh, each of these episodes will be. Will it be two hours, perhaps? Maybe the last episode will be two hours. I should think so. Then maybe next week's ep- or this week's episode, I should say, uh, the standard one-hour format. But either way, Ultima Lucha looks epic. I think someone called in on the PW Torch live cast last week's, I think the one after Battleground or the post-Raw, some one of those. They called in and they were there when they were taping Ultima Lucha and he's pleased about the outcome of that event. So that's something we can look forward to, that at least someone was on the ground, they saw it happen, and without spoiling, they at least gave us the you know, the green light that it's worth waiting for. So hopefully that will lead to a season two, because, I mean, Lucha Underground, it is a great show, great story, great matches. You've got all the you know, some amazing uh, wrestlers and characters, uh, outside ring characters, and you know, a season two and beyond would be something. It it, it yeah, it deserves a season two. It deserves to be around because, I mean, once TNA goes, if it goes in September, and of course, I think maybe by then, uh, Global Force Wrestling will be on TV. They are currently doing tapings. But still, while we have all these shows happening uh, every week, let Lucha Underground be that alternative to what we what we normally get with WWE, with Ring of Honor, with TNA. So, oh, and of course, uh, New Japan on Fridays. So on Wednesdays, if we're going to talk Wednesdays, then you've got Lucha Underground. Let it be that alternative show. You no know, Lucha... Lucha style, we don't really get much of that. But with Lucha Underground, we do get a lot of um, that style of professional wrestling. You know, something that people can, can check out. So I'm hoping it'll stick around, it'll get season two, to get more uh, more popular, more seasons there about. So in this episode, uh, the main event wasn't a match, it was... Supposedly, Prince Puma was going to come out and address the crowd. Seems he hasn't talked 
yet, Prince Puma. So this was the episode where he was going to speak for the very first time. And also in this episode, the medallions were finally explained by Dario, talking about what they are for exactly. And the final medallion, the seventh one, which was won by Phoenix until he was taken out by Mil Muertes uh, some episodes back, was on the line. But the highlights from this episode, Prince Puma going to address the crowd, and we had the medallions. Dario explaining exactly what are they for, why have these uh, luchadors been collecting these medallions, what is it leading to. And also, a couple of matches were set up for Ultima Lucha, uh, Hernandez versus Drago. Uh, the stipulation was set for it. It would be a lumberjack match, so to speak. But this time, the lumberjacks are members of the fan crowd, right? Fans will be the lumberjacks, and they'll have weapons. Uh, well, in particular, they'll have belts. So, you know, if either Hernandez or Drago ends up among those lumberjacks, they can be attacked, and they can fight back, of course, but I think it's unique that the lumberjacks get to attack the wrestlers. The wrestlers can attack the lumberjacks. So they called this match the Believers... Is it Believers... What is it called? Believers Backlash Match. Yeah, that's what they've called this match. And also set for Ultima Lucha is the Mac versus the machine, uh, the man called Cage. They'll be fighting in a false count anyway. That'll be the very first match of Ultima Lucha. Mac versus Cage, false count anyway. I mean, that's going to... These guys, they can put on an epic match, especially uh, the Mac. When you see him, you think, man, this guy is huge, but he flies around and he's agile and everything. I mean, he moves, this guy. But you look at him and you think, nah, he can't really do much, but he can go. So I'm looking forward to this false count anywhere match. He's got two victories over Cage. So will Cage get his revenge over Mac at Ultima Lucha in this big match? Hoping to see what happens there. But um, as far as the medallions are concerned, this is what Dario had to say about them. When collected, these medallions, they are placed in a belt, which he calls the Gift of the Gods belt. Right? When you've got this belt, you can, so to speak, though he, he clearly said that you don't cash in the belt, but just for layman's terms, just for argument's sake, you cash in this belt for a shot at the Lucha Underground Championship. Okay, so you have to prove to Dario that you um, you are ready to qualify for a uh, title shot. You have to convince him that you can, you are ready for a title shot as well to give him time to promote the match, as he said. So at Ultima Lucha, the holders of those medallions they will fight in a Gift of the Gods match. There are seven. Uh, holders of these medallions. They'll compete in this Gift of the Gods match at Ultima Lucha. The winner, of course, gets the the belt and we'll see what's the way forward. When will they, uh, quotes, cash in for that title shot? He also said that other uh, wrestlers, they can fight you for that belt, which I like because just like with the money in the bank briefcase, they rarely, the, the holder of the briefcase rarely defends uh, the briefcase against other superstars. And I think that should be something that should happen often. You know, like a championship belt, the briefcase should be treated like that. And with this gift of the God's belt, I like that they're treating it that way, that you have to defend it against other wrestlers. So... We could have people winning the belt, new holders for it, and you know it keeps it not only relevant, but you know we have new faces around 
uh, this belt, not just the same faces, you know. So really curious to see who will win that Gift of the Gods match and who will be um, the wrestler that will cash it in and who will be champion, you know, because, because we've got Prince Puma defending the title against Mil Muertes at Ultima Lucha. Anyone, I mean, can't really see who's going to come out of that one as champion. Both of these guys could come, either one of them could be the champion. So with this Gift of the Gods belt and whoever will end up as Lucha Underground champion, we'll have to see at uh, Ultima Lucha. And another thing I liked about the, the medallion situation, there's seven of them. And once that Gift of the Gods belt is cashed in, the medallions are redistributed Pretty much like, uh, for those of you who know Dragon Ball, sorry, Dragon Ball Z as well. When you collect the Dragon Balls and you make your wish, Dragon uh, the Dragon Balls are scattered again and you have to collect them. So I kind of like what they did with the medallions. You cash in the Gift of the God's Belt, the medallions, they're scattered again and people are collecting them once more. So the medallion concept i think that's unique to lucha underground and it's pretty cool i like that and it, at least it leads to something an end goal this gift of the gods belt so really excited about that the seventh medallion which i'd said was belonged to phoenix it was going to be put on the line in a battle royal then phoenix returned from nowhere and Dario decided to put him into this uh, battle royal. Phoenix, of course, he survived. He won back his medal. So he will be taking part in that Gift of the Gods match at Ultima Lucha. So that was Ultima Lucha. We had some, some great action. We had uh, Johnny Mundo versus uh, Tejano. Uh, apparently these guys, they've never faced each other in all... Uh, Lucha Underground. So this was their very first encounter. This was an epic match. It was the opening match of the show. Great match. Back and forth action. Anyone could have won it. Both of these guys have got big matches at Ultima Lucha. So the match itself ended in DQ and Tejano was attacked by uh, these guys who call themselves the crew. Uh, Sis Mr. Cisco and uh, Cortez. Some guy named Cortez, yeah. They attacked uh, Tejano. Johnny Mundo would also join in and attack uh, Tejano, only to be saved by uh, Alberto El Patron, or Alberto Del Rio, as we know him from WWE. He came down, took out the crew. Johnny Mundo hightailed it. And then there was a moment between Alberto and Tejano. These guys, they're not on good terms. They have beef, but... Just for this time, they decided to just let it go. So we'll find out what happens going forward between these two guys. What's going to happen uh, between them. So that was Lucha Underground in a nutshell. Let's just run down the card for Ultima Lucha. We've got the Mac versus Cage. False Count Anyway, that's our first match of the event. We've got Johnny Mundo versus uh, Alberto El Patron. We've got that Gift of the Gods seven-way match. We've got Tejano versus Blue Demon Jr. We've got Vampiro versus Pentagon Jr. The trio's championship held by Ivelisse, Son of Havoc, and Angelico will be on the line against the Disciples of Death. These are these mask-wearing three guys who are they hang around Mil Muertes and Katrina. They're fighting. Those three for the trio's championship. And then we've got Hernandez versus Drago in that Believers Backlash match, which is Lumberjack match uh, featuring fans with, uh, with weapons. Then we've got the Lucha Underground Championship on the line. The champion Prince Puma defending it against Mil Muertes. Big match there. Looking forward to it. Ultima Lucha. Great card. Looking forward to that event. Then we had the main event. Prince Puma was out to 
address the crowd, but before he could do that, Milmortes would come out uh, just to stare down with Prince Puma, but that didn't last very long because he was attacked by the Disciples of Death. Of course, Prince Puma, he fought his way through, he took care of the Disciples. Then Milmortes came into the ring, and him and Prince Puma, they went at it for just a brief uh, brief time, Puma got the upper hand. He took care of Milmuertes as possibly a sign of what will happen at Ultima Lucha. Will he overcome Milmuertes or will this man of a thousand deaths, will he defeat Prince Puma and become the new champion? I think it should be interesting if Milmuertes becomes champion. What will be the way forward, you know? Um... Because I think that's the reason why I prefer, most of the time, um, I'm in favor of heels, you know, like winning the first match in a feud. Because now you have a reason for the babyface to fight back, some motivation for them to want a rematch, you know, and keep the feud going. So, again, even if Prince Puma uh, retains the championship, I'm still curious to see who excuse me, who will be the the person who will win the gift of the God's belt, you know? When will they uh, supposedly cash in uh, for that championship shot? Uh, hopefully moving into season two. So I think either Prince Puma or Mil Muertes winning that match, I'm looking forward to it, hoping it will lead to a season two. So... Fingers crossed, guys. Lucha Underground stays and continues. Uh, the superstars were taking part in that Gift of the Gods seven-way match. Yeah, I should have mentioned them. We've got Jack Evans. You've got King Cuerno. You've got Sexy Star. You've got Aerostar. You've got Bengala. And you've got Big Rick. Now, at the beginning of Lucha Underground, this guy was talking to Dario Cuerto that um, I think... They had some deals from the past, and Rick had always come through, so he wanted that seventh medallion uh, from Dario Cuerto. So he got well, not the seventh medallion, but there was a there were two medallions free. There was the Phoenix medallion, and then there was uh, a second. This second medallion is the one that Big Rick got from Dario right away. So yeah, that's how he got into this. Gift of the Gods match. So that was Lucha Underground. Eventful. And looking forward to Ultima Lucha. Then we move on to Ring of Honor. Which was celebrating its 200th episode. They had um, a lot of matches covered. Most of the uh, the matches that they had. Aside from the, the main event. The matches that they were showing on this episode. Were... You know, matches from the past that have happened during these 200 uh, episodes. It's great. And, you know, seeing these matches made me wish that I had started watching Ring of Honor back then. I mean, it looked so exciting when, uh, you know, Kevin Owens or Kevin Steen, when he was still in Ring of Honor, they showed a match where he was involved. I would have loved to see him in Ring of Honor. They had... Uh, AJ Styles taking on one of the... Is it Hanson? He's part of War Machine. Yeah. That that match that was great. That... Uh, was it Donovan... Donovan Dijak? Should be. Uh, he's part of the House of Truth with Truth Martini, with Jay Lethal, with Jay Diesel. Donovan Dijak, yeah. Uh, he won this... Prospect match, the 2015 Ring of Honor prospect. He's the 2015 prospect. He won that match. That was a great, great match. Uh, I'd wish I'd seen it, but anyway, I got into the Ring of Honor train a little bit late, so I'll just make do with what they've got right now. Anyway, the main event was House of Truth. Uh, Truth Martini was in this match. It was pretty hilarious. Teaming up with uh, Jay Lethal, with Donovan Dijak, and uh, Jay Diesel. They were taking on the Briscoes, 
uh, Roderick Strong and ODB. Yeah, ODB. Epic match there ended with uh, ODB spraying uh, Truth Martini with liquor, blinding him, and then she got the quick cover. Uh, what I liked about this match, uh, Truth Martini, he is a wrestler, um, sure, but though he's mostly a manager now, but I liked that in the entire match, uh, except for the ending, of course, he had his sunglasses on, and the commentators, they touched on that, that he still has his sunglasses, is he going to wrestle or not? And he was just there basically for, I'd say, maybe comedy, because... He didn't really do that much, except um, in the middle when they teamed up on ODB. And of course, he got the pin in the end. But it was fun to have him in the match. It was pretty cool. So that was the main event. And of course, they were promoting their next pay-per-view, which happened on Friday, Death Before Dishonor. It hadn't popped up online when I was checking over the weekend. I'll check again. Hopefully it's out now and I can watch it. That was Ring of Honor. Then TNA. What happened on TNA? There was uh, a couple of matches. Mostly there's some segments like Dixie coming out at the beginning of the show to talk about the next inductee. In the 2015 TNA Hall of Fame, this was Jeff Jarrett. He'll be inducted this week. Looking forward to that. We had uh, a street fight between Magnus and Bram. Bram would uh, get one over Magnus, low blow the ref. Oh, well, it was a street fight, so even if the ref had seen it, it wouldn't have mattered. But Magnus fell victim to that. James Storm would come out after that match, to let Magnus know that he has found his female partner for the tag team against Mickey James and Magnus. I should think it's happening this week. Yeah, it's happening. It should be happening this week's episode. So that female partner would be introduced later in the evening as um, Serena. Now, I don't know much about uh, Serena, but when I checked out Wikipedia, uh, she's a retired uh, pro wrestler. Maybe she was on yeah she's she was on WWE when I wasn't um, in touch with WWE because there was a period where I wasn't watching uh, wrestling. I didn't get access to it. The channel, the one channel that shows wrestling here where I am, I don't think they were showing it at the time, until a couple of years later. So maybe that's when uh, Serena was on. So she was introduced as James Storm's tag team partner. They'll be taking on Mickey James and Magnus. Then we had Eli Drake coming out to talk about why he attacked Drew Galloway the previous week, which cost him a title match against EC3. Um, talking about uh, that his intention, of course, was to break up the the rising. So, you know, the funny thing is when he got injured, uh, quotes, injured in the couple of weeks back where the the rising would face the, the BDC, the losing uh, stable would have to disband. When he got injured, it looked legit. I actually thought, yeah, he's been injured for real. So I'll give uh, Drake props for that because I actually thought he was injured for real. But, well, he faked that. So his whole intention was to break the rising. He didn't like uh, being in Drew Galloway's shadow. He wanted to be his own man. But anyway, he had his reasons. And... My my issue now is what happens to to Micah, you know. I kind of felt like he was in the background while Drew Galloway and uh, Eli Drake, they pretty much had the spotlight. So I wonder now what happens to to Micah. Um, what's the way forward for him? Because he should be someone, you know, getting some kind of push. If I'm not mistaken, he's the son of a legend, Haku, King Haku. Yeah, 
he's the son of that guy. So why is he in the background? They should do something with him. Maybe have him get his uh, shot at uh, Eli Drake. They can feud and then you can bring in Drew Galloway. But, or maybe just have Drew Galloway and Eli, they feud. And then maybe bring Micah in. Maybe it will be a, a three-way feud. We'll see. Uh, perhaps uh, this is the three-way that should be happening between the Shield. You know, maybe it'll happen sometime in the future. We'll see. But Drew Galloway, he would come out, have a little uh, fight with uh, Eli Drake. Drake, of course, getting away. We'll find out it'll be the way forward for these two guys. When will they have their big one-on-one match? Also, had a uh, former former knockout champion, Taron Terrell, coming out to throw a tantrum because she lost the title last week. Uh, the new champion, Brooke, of course, would come out to address Terrell, letting her know that you lost the championship, so whining about it now isn't going to help. But if she wants a shot at the belt, Brooke is more than ready to take her on. Uh, Taryn was coming out to possibly attack Brooke when the lights went out and then Gail came out. Uh, the, um, Terrell was in a, a cage when she was out to uh, cut a promo. So she left the cage, leaving the dollhouse inside the cage. So when the lights went out and they came back on, the cage was locked. Gail Kim was inside. She took care of the dollhouse and... Of course, Taryn chased around the ring by Brooke, uh, being forced to watch Gail take care of the dollhouse. So, wonder what's the way forward now, as far as Gail, as far as the knockouts championship is concerned. What's going to happen there? Then there was a chain match: uh, Eric Young versus Spud. Eric Young took care of Spud there. Spud he did put on some offense against Eric Eric Young but of course Eric Young he got the win there then we had uh, Tigre Uno a segment of Tigre Uno uh talking about what Donald Trump has said in the media about uh, Mexicans so he challenged Donald Trump to come to TNA this week uh possibly watch Tigre Uno in a match, uh, show him that, hey, whatever Donald Trump may have said about Mexicans, he is a Mexican actually doing something. You know what I mean? So we'll find out what happens with Donald Trump. Will he accept the challenge? Will he come to, to TNA? Probably not. But I think it was fascinating that he would challenge Donald Trump to show up on TNA. So we'll find out if Donald Trump will accept the challenge from the X Division champion Tigre Uno. Then the main event was a tables match, number one contendership on the line. This was between Matt Hardy and Bobby Roode. Bobby Roode is one of the NX yeah, the TNA guys I know of who's going to uh Global Force Wrestling. The other wrestler is Magnus. So I'm wondering now, could this have been Bobby Roode's final match because uh, he lost this match and Matt Hardy is the number one contender for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship. I think he should be fighting EC3 this week. So I wonder what happens with Bobby Roode. It's unfortunate, really. I mean, all these superstars leaving TNA... um, Maybe they've got new guys signed who are coming into uh, TNA while these guys are leaving. But having these, you know, you can't think of TNA without, you know, Magnus, uh, Bobby Roode. But now that they're going to uh, Global Force Wrestling, what happens to TNA? They did announce also that their Bound for Glory pay-per-view is happening in October. I thought their equivalent to WrestleMania is uh, Slammiversary, but Bound for Glory is the equivalent to WrestleMania. So I'm looking forward to that 
uh, pay-per-view hoping hoping uh, wondering by then what will be uh what will be the fate of TNA it's happening in October and you know there's talk about uh, Destination America uh, canceling uh TNA in September so what will be what will be uh the environment for TNA B by the time Bound for Glory comes around we'll find out shall we then we've got NXT event for episode here we saw the return of the new NXT champion Finn Balor um who would also be involved in a contract signing for his match against Kevin Owens the rematch happening at Takeover Brooklyn odd because when they mentioned Brooklyn the crowd booed and I mean I thought that was ridiculous because what would they have against Brooklyn sure the event isn't happening in full sales so uh, what's their problem with Brooklyn they're still going to watch the uh, Takeover so you know I found it odd that they would boo Brooklyn so anyway uh, Finn Balor would come out to address the crowd at the top of the show. He's happy to be NXT champion. Um, looking forward to his rematch against Owens. Um, they had a promo exchange during the contract signing. We'll touch on that. Uh, Match-wise, we had Bailey coming back uh, into action, taking on Emma. She defeated Emma. Got, uh, got her revenge, but I don't think this feud is over. I hope we'll get a couple of matches, a couple of more matches out uh, between these two girls. Uh, Bailey cutting a promo after that match. Glad to be back. And her eyes are set on the NXT Women's Championship. But first, she'd like to take on former NXT Women's Champion Charlotte. So that will be the next big match for Bailey, but well, the crowd wasn't really too happy about uh, her challenging Charlotte, considering that uh, Charlotte is a crowd big crowd favorite right now because of the you know the Divas Revolution happening on the the main roster. So interesting that Bailey would challenge uh, uh, Charlotte instead of you know. Now that she's back, she can deal with Emma and possibly go one-on-one against uh, Dana Brooke. But she's going after Charlotte. And I think, well, I'm hoping that Bailey will be the next NXT Women's Champion since Charlotte, Sasha Banks, and Becky Lynch, they've moved up to the main roster. So rather than, you know, me complaining about the NXT Women's Championship not being featured on the main roster, which happened again uh, on SmackDown. There was some tag team action. We'll touch on that. But no NXT Championship uh, ringside. I don't understand. So if at least someone from NXT wins that title, at least it will remain on NXT where it, where it can be featured like it should. So I'm all, I'm all up for Bailey. Uh, going for the NXT Women's Championship, let her be the next champion. Just like uh, in our audio universe, she's the current WWE Women's Champion. So I think it would be fitting. Bailey is the next NXT Women's Champion. Help uh, build her up until she's ready to move on to the main roster. Hopefully, by the time she moves up to the main roster, the revolution, you know. Uh, will have ended, so to speak, and we've got these NXT women, they're now into the main roster permanently, and, you know, we're seeing some change uh, among the the divas, you know, because of these NXT women. So, Bailey challenging Charlotte, and thinking ahead, as far as the NXT Women's Championship is concerned, I'm all for it, hope to see what happens, uh, Going forward, maybe she'll face Sasha Banks at Brooklyn. We had Eva Marie competing in her debut NXT match against uh, Casey, the Australian girl. I think she should be pushed some more. She's showing uh, a lot of talent. I think 
she can go quite far. She can feature against, you know, maybe Emma or Dana Brooke or Alexa Bliss, Blue Pants, all these other NXT women who uh, I would say are mid-card going into uh, top tier, you know. So she was taking on Eva Marie. Surprise that Eva Marie actually put on a decent match against Casey. I thought that, you know, considering that fans don't really like, yeah, well, they hate Eva Marie right now. So I thought that, you know, with that and, you know, she's going to be lousy in the ring, but it was a decent match. I have nothing to com- nothing really to complain about except that well, when she hit the, the finisher, which was uh, the Brian Kendrick's sliced bread number two. I think that's the name of the, the move. Yeah, she hit that move, but commentary, they didn't call the move. I hoped they would call the move, you know. Excuse me, Brian Kendrick was on NXT some time back. They know that's his finisher. Why didn't they acknowledge that, hey, she's been training with the Brian Kendrick all this time. She's just used his finisher. That's slice bread number two for fans who don't know the move, but uh, they know Brian Kendrick. I thought they should have at least uh, mentioned that. But, well, they didn't. Eva Marie, she got the victory over Casey. Wondering what's the way forward for her. I mean, right now the crowd is against her. So if she can work the heel role really well, I think build her up as a heel um, up to the point where at least... Fans think she's a cool heel, but keep her as a heel. Keep her doing, you know, heelish moves. Because I think JR and a lot of, uh, you know, wrestling analysts, they really talk about uh, heel, uh, the heels of today, that they're not really heels. They're not really doing uh, a lot of heelish moves. And, you know, as far as what they do in the ring and all that, they're not really portraying that role uh, of the classic heel. So with Eva Marie, I think they can build her up as that heel. Keep building her and building her until the crowd starts, you know, think she's a cool heel, but keep her as a heel until you're ready to turn her as, uh, make a baby face. Hopefully by then she'll be at least uh, mid-card level as far as, you know, her wrestling, uh, Ability NXT women's uh, division. She's mid card level. She can go into a match against the likes of uh, Carmella, Alexa Bliss, uh, Alexa Bliss, sorry, and the like. Yeah, so I'm hoping that's my idea for Eva Marie. Build her up as a heel, keep her as a heel for a while, and then turn her later. And hope. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that by then, fans will. Um, They'll like her again, and they're set to believe that, you know, she's no longer a diva, but she's now a female wrestler, proper wrestler. And she can, you know, move away from that uh, diva image that people have uh, as far as Eva Marie is concerned. Then we had the VOD villains taking on um, upcoming NXT talent, they are facing the champions, Blake and Murphy, for the titles this week. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's this week. So, the way I see it is Blake and Murphy will defeat the Vod villains for the the tag titles, the retain titles. And then Enzo Amore and uh, Big Cass become number one contenders again, and they'll defeat Blake and Murphy in Brooklyn. Because, again, I'm sure they are from Brooklyn. So them winning the titles um, in front of uh, the Brooklyn crowd, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is the biggest NXT crowd they've had to date. So it'll be a big, big deal. So I think have them win the titles there. The Ford Villains, they defeated these guys, no problem. Uh, Baron Corbin, the crowd, uh, they no longer like Baron Corbin, unfortunately. Um, taking on another upcoming NXT guy, matched in last 
10 seconds. I mean, he got in the ring, bell was rung, guy was sent to the ropes, coming in for end of days, one, two, three, done. That was Corbin. No nonsense whatsoever. Then we had a segment with Tyler Breeze talking to general manager uh, William Regal about, you know, possibly getting him involved uh, at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Have something for, for, for Tyler Breeze, general manager. He'll get to it. Wonder what he's got in store for Tyler Breeze. Then we've got, we had Samoa Joe. He was also taking on another upcoming NXT guy. Quick match there, Samoa Joe. He got his victory. Then our main event, the, the contract signing for that rematch for the NXT title, Finn Balor versus Kevin Owens. Uh, there was a great promo exchange between the two guys. Kevin Owens, he brought up some points uh, saying, you know, how does it feel to go into this uh, event as the champion and still uh, as the underdog, talking about what he has done since becoming NXT champion in you know, a record short time, I think yeah, six months. He became NXT champion two months after debuting on NXT, talking to Finn about what has he done so far. It took him this long to become NXT champion. He touched on the fact that he took out uh, Sami Zayn, uh, that he took out uh, Neville, that he defeated John Cena. You know that track record that Owens has built up to this point, and Finn Balor would count as well. Telling Owens that the win in Japan was not a fluke, and at Brooklyn, he will shove Kevin Owens' words down his throat. That was their promo. They had a little scuffle there. Kevin Owens taking out William Regal, but Finn Balor would get one over Owens. He was left standing. Owens, of course, tail between his legs, left. Uh, had to leave the ring, but sets up their big match in Brooklyn. The rematch, Finn Balor versus Kevin Owens. What will be the way forward? They will Kevin. Well, I don't think Kevin Owens will defeat Finn Balor uh, in Brooklyn. But if he loses and he has a match uh, at SummerSlam, will his loss in Brooklyn will it factor into his match at SummerSlam? Will it make him, you know, frustrated, more aggressive against uh, whoever he's booked against uh, at SummerSlam? Curious to find out. What happens there? What will WWE do as far as Kevin Owens is concerned? Owens, again, would be featured on SmackDown, which is what we're going to touch on next. Next, This is the, the final show. This was a pretty eventful SmackDown. We had Dean Ambrose versus Sheamus. A great match. They're very physical. You can always expect... Um, Sheamus and Ambrose, the likes to, you know, put on an epic match. This also, maybe I can touch, as far as Sheamus is concerned, um, Murph's YT13, in his Raw review last week, he posed the question, um, who would uh, you have Seth Rollins defend his, uh, his title against at SummerSlam? And... I said I would bring, I would have Sheamus defend, uh, face Seth Rollins for the title at SummerSlam. Uh, considering that all the possible options right now are busy, you're looking at uh, Roman Reigns, you're looking at Ambrose. Um, yeah, those are the guys. You, Randy Orton, of course. Uh, well, do we really? I don't think he's ready to get back into the title picture right now. So, not Randy Orton. So, I'd suggested Sheamus because, well, he's good in the ring. I mean, as far as performance in the ring, you can count on Sheamus to pull through. He's not bad in the ring. Promo-wise, no problem there. He can hold his own with the mic. But I think the issue that people have with Sheamus, I mean, now, because, you know, whatever goodwill that fans had, 
uh, for Sheamus. It's been spent, and you can blame WWE for that because the way fans see Sheamus now, you know, he's a heel again, but fans don't care. He was a, a babyface previously, but that run as a babyface, it didn't suit him. It was, it's, I think it started well, but um, it just felt like this isn't the Sheamus we got to know. I mean, when he was heel the first time, when he defeated uh, John Cena for the WWE Championship, that Sheamus, yeah, he had a connection with the fans, despite being a heel, but fans preferred that Sheamus to, you know, babyface Sheamus to the Sheamus that we've got right now. So I'd blame WWE for having, you know, wasted the goodwill that fans had for Sheamus. And it's unfortunate because he's so invested in his new role as a heel, you know. He's really putting in the effort to uh, make it something, but, you know, fans... They don't care anymore, and I feel sorry for Sheamus because he's really working hard uh, as a heel right now. So I'd have had him defa- uh, face Rollins for the title rather than him coming in to cash in. I see Sheamus as the type of guy who would go up to a champion's face and tell him that, hey, I'm cashing in this briefcase. I'm facing you at the pay-per-view, um, like what RVD did, uh, just cashing in there and then. So that's how they've booked Sheamus. I'd have had Sheamus beat Rollins. They have their rematch at Night of Champions. Uh, Sheamus uh, retains. I'll build Sheamus as a top heel champion. Right? I'd have him face the likes of uh, Dean Ambrose. Have him face Roman Reigns. Because I know him versus Roman Reigns. There are some great matches. There are physical matches between those, between them. Um, right through up to the end of the year, and then Royal Rumble, have Brock Lesnar win it, right? So your main event is Sheamus as champion defending it against Brock Lesnar, and I can tell you that fans would pay uh, to watch that main event. I certainly believe so, regardless of you know Sheamus being involved in that match, but fans would pay. For Lesnar, like what happened this year, uh, Roman Reigns versus Lesnar, fans weren't paying for Roman Reigns. Um, I'd say more fans were paying for Lesnar than they were for Roman for Roman Reigns. So I think it would be the same case. You have Lesnar, the challenger, going up against this big heel, Sheamus. And then you have Lesnar winning back the WWE title at at WrestleMania. I think fans would appreciate that. I think fans would go for that because at the end of the day, you've got your big heel, Sheamus, and you've got your big baby face, Brock Lesnar. And if you promote that main event as a big fight uh, for WrestleMania, fans would be into it. I'm sure. And of course, you're going to have Lesnar win the championship even better. So, yeah, that was... Uh, how I responded to the question about who would face Rollins. So, back to to SmackDown. Uh, Ambrose versus Sheamus. Physical match. Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper would get involved, distracting uh, Dean Ambrose, but the match was still going, so Sheamus would get the upper hand, bro kick to Ambrose, getting the win. I honestly wonder what will happen, you know, as far as Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt is concerned, because it just seems like Dean Ambrose can never get that win over Bray Wyatt, that much-needed win. You know, hopefully it'll happen in future. I don't know, but I think it's a wasted cause because they wasted the feud that they had um, late last year, coming into this year. It's unfortunate. With Neville versus Adam Rose. Um, Adam Rose without his party crew um, he is changing drastically I wonder where they are going as far as Adam Rose is concerned Neville getting the win there we had a post-match promo from Stardust 
uh, they're going to have a, are they going to have a, another match at SummerSlam Pop, uh, possibly a kick off match uh, though I would have hoped it will be you know a match featured on the actual show so we'll find out what happens as far as Neville and Stardust is concerned uh, Barrett came out cutting a promo perhaps this is a reset uh, for the King Barrett character because it was getting annoying that, you know, he's been feud, feuding with our truth but it's not really going anywhere. He's king of the ring, but, you know, there's no really, not much of a direction what's going on. So with this promo that he cut, hopefully it's a reset for King Barrett and we finally see what's the way, what they're going to do as far as King Barrett is concerned. Then we had Kevin Owens versus Rusev. Uh, the match, physical match, but it ended in count out when Kevin Owens he decided to walk out on Rusev, classic heel, and the promo that he cut uh, at the beginning uh, before the match. This was the promo that a lot of people say should have been made on Monday Night Raw. You know, right after Battleground, where he's trying to justify his loss to John Cena at Battleground and having walked away from that uh, six-man tag team main event on Raw. You know, the classic heel saying he didn't want to, you know, uh, injure himself. So he would rather, you know, just walk away or uh, accept a loss so he can fight another day. That was Kevin Owens as far as his loss against John Cena and what transpired in that six-man tag team main event on Raw is concerned. So Owens, he wasn't hurt by the loss at Battleground or walking away from that main event. He bounced back. Classic heel. And that's what most of us were hoping for, that he bounces back from that loss. And he did. But, you know, he's walking away from this match against Rusev he confronted Cesaro backstage, who was uh, cutting a promo based on the main event match he was going to have against the WWE champion Seth Rollins later on. Owens would show up. There would be a promo exchange between him and Cesaro. And I'd say, you know, Cesaro, just give him some time. He's not, I mean, he's not uh, a promo guy yet, but... Just give him some time and, you know, he'll be good at promos because it would have been, you know, some cause for concern if he's not good at promos and he's not really good in the ring. So, but he's good in the ring. So fans, you know, they, can, they can't they can be really uh, too touchy about uh, Cesaro's mic skills. So I think people should be patient with him and I hope WWE as well will be patient with him just let him uh, build his promo skills. Uh, because, yeah, in this promo, it was okay, but it could have been better because Owens was clearly uh, leading the promo uh, exchange between these two guys. But Cesaro, he didn't uh, flop or, you know, he didn't lose uh, his cool or his touch. He kept up with Owens. So Cesaro uh, will give you some time. Uh, there shouldn't be any worries. Uh, as far as his promo skills are concerned. Then we had uh, Divas Tag Team Action, Naomi and Sasha Banks against the Bellas with Tamina and Alicia Fox at ringside. Again, Sasha Banks without the championship belt. You know, I'm really not liking what's going on uh, as far as the NXT Women's Championship title is concerned. Why can't she come out with it to the ring and yet you know that graphic that they have uh when they announce uh their matches on a show she has the title there but come match time she doesn't have the the championship and i asked uh wade keller for those of you who know wade keller he's the editor for the pw torch the pro wrestling torch uh uh, is it newsletter? Yeah, it's been going on since the 80s. Yeah, he's a big deal guy. I think he was he, he was recently inducted into, 
I think the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, yeah, recently inducted. So I asked him on Twitter, though I didn't expect him to respond, but he did. Um, he had addressed the issue on his, uh, though it's exclusive for VIPs, uh, on one of his shows, exclusive for VIPs. So he had already addressed the issue, and I'd hoped to get his thoughts on it, but, well, he had already addressed the issue. Um, he asked me why I'm not on VIP, and I told him that, uh, well, I can't, given my current circumstances. My internet access is limited. I have no means to go VIP where I am. So I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Keller. But again, really, Sasha Banks without the championship, what's up with that? Whose idea was it to uh, keep Sasha from coming out with the NXT title? I'm not liking that. But anyway, uh, it was a great match. Uh, back and forth, Nikki Bella would get the advantage later on. Uh, because the Divas, they, eventually it broke out into a brawl outside. Uh, Nikki was left in the ring with uh, Naomi. Naomi was looking to hit rear view, but Nikki, she dodged it uh, to take down Naomi with that, uh, I'd say it's a forearm attack, if not an elbow. I'd have to, I'd have to confirm what it is. But yeah, that attack, that forearm attack, I guess, took out Naomi and then rack attack for the win. Then we had the main event, Rollins versus Cesaro. Again, Cesaro getting to shine with a main event guy. He could have won this match, honestly, just like uh, his matches against John Cena. You wouldn't have de- uh, expected any less from Cesaro. He kept up with the champion, gave him a fight. But, of course, Rollins taking advantage with a thumb to the eye, when Cesaro was looking for the the swing, thumb to the eye, and then an Irish whip to the corner, Cesaro would smash his shoulder against the steel post. Then, of course, Rollins take advantage of that, the pedigree, and the 1-2-3 over Cesaro. But that wasn't the end. Kevin Owens coming out after that match, putting Cesaro out with the papa power bomb insult to injury so you've got Kevin Owens walking out of a match against Rusev and you've got him attacking Cesaro so do we have a match there for SummerSlam triple threat Owens Cesaro Rusev I'm all for that match because at least they have something to do at SummerSlam and maybe after SummerSlam that's when you can uh, have your reset and you figure out what to do with these guys because you know, I think a lot of people had hoped that Owens would be the man who would defeat John Cena for the United States Championship. And if he had defeated Cena, you have Owens already set for some good feuds as champion. I mean, like after defeating Cena in their rematch, but you can have Owens as champion versus Rusev, Owens as champion against Cesaro. Both feuds could have kept them busy up to the end of the year. You see, that's how good a program they had if Owens was United States champion. But right now, he lost to Cena. What's the way forward for Owens? What's the way forward for Cena? Who's the next guy who can uh, take on Cena aside from Owens? And uh, Cesaro is out of the picture again. So I wonder, what's the way forward for Cesaro, Owens, Rusev, Cena, the United States championship? So that was my review for those week for last week's uh, shows. Hope you guys you enjoyed it. Looking forward to Monday Night Raw and the shows happening this week. I'd say part one of two for Ultima Lucha kicking off this week. Look forward to that. Vod Villains versus Blake and Murphy NXT Tag Team Titles on the line. So thank you guys. I will catch you when we bring back. Audio Universe, and my raw review. Thank you.